Good morning, everyone. Good to see all of you. If you'd like to open your Bibles to Luke 14. On Sunday mornings, we're working our way through Luke's gospel verse by verse. We find ourselves at chapter 14, verse 27. Why don't you stand for the reading of God's word, please? We're going to back up to verse 25 for context. Now, great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You may be seated. Father, what a shocking thing for your son to say to those following him when he was on the earth. But we recognize that as much as he said this to the crowds that were following him, in his day he says this to us as those who would entertain being his follower, his disciples. And so I pray, Lord, that we would receive this as from Christ himself, that we would um, hear this challenge from him and that everything he intended by these words w- would be understood by us. And should we choose to be followers of Christ, then apply it to our lives and help us to understand, which is what I believe Jesus is doing here, um, what exactly is involved in following him. And so, Lord, I pray you would use me as the teacher of your word this morning to be faithful, to um, rightly divide this, and to deliver all the wonderful uh, and sobering and challenging truths from it that you have for your people, for their benefit, Lord, for their sanctification. We pray that Christ can be exalted during this time, that it would be about his glory and honor, uh, people understanding what it means to follow him, challenge each of us, Lord. I don't know how anyone could read these verses and not be challenged. I pray that the full weight of them could be be taught this morning from this pulpit. And I thank you for this time, Lord, and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. So we're in the middle of what I think is the clearest teaching on discipleship in all of Scripture. And you notice at the beginning of the verse, verse 25 it says great crowds were following jesus we talked for a couple weeks that while many religious leaders would probably be thinking about what would allow these large crowds to be even larger it seemed that jesus wanted to discourage people from following him and of all the shocking statements he made we have reached the most shocking this morning in verse 27 he said whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple and this brings us to lesson one jesus said you cannot be my disciple if you won't lesson one learn and then do you cannot be my disciple if you will not learn and then do i'm going to back up just a little bit to get some momentum into this lesson when I taught elementary school, I'd stand up at the whiteboard and I would teach these problems or uh, model them for my students as clearly as possible. I'd tell the students what they're supposed to do, and then I'd encourage the students to try to do it on their own. And then I'd walk around the classroom and I'd look over the students' shoulders and see their work and recognize that all of the students in the class fell into one of these two categories. There were those who were applying the teaching that they had received, and there were those who would not. The interesting thing is both groups receive the exact same teaching from me, right? They're in the same classroom, listening to the same instruction, seeing the same examples. When I coach wrestling, something similar would occur. I'd commit an amount of most practices to teaching new moves. I'd bring up the assistant coach, and we model these moves for the wrestlers, and then you put the wrestlers in pairs around the wrestling room, and then they begin practicing those moves that you just taught and you recognize that all the athletes fall into one of two categories, the same two categories that the students would fall into. Those who were going to not just learn, but also do, and those who ended up being simply learners and uh, heard the instruction, but were not applying it. And one of the most exciting things about being a teacher or a coach is seeing um, athletes or students applying those things that you have taught them. My assumption is that God would have some of the same pleasure himself when he looks down and sees his children applying the teaching from his word that we are receiving. I probably don't have to tell you out of these two categories which students and athletes did well, right? It's going to be those students or athletes not that just received the teaching or instruction, but those that applied it. 
And I mention this because we have the same potential with God's Word to find ourselves in one of those two categories. In fact, all of you are putting yourself in one of those two categories right now while I'm talking. There are those of you who are committed to applying the teaching that you received this morning, and there are those of you who believe that simply, you know, walking through the doors and coming to church this morning is, is enough. So it is great to listen, but one of the themes in Scripture is that we must go further than that, not just to being listeners or hearers of God's Word, but also doers. Here's a few verses. Matthew 7, 24, Jesus said, "'Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock.'" Luke 8, 21, Jesus said, "'My mother and my brothers are those who hear the Word of God and do it.'" If you, John 13, 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them, not just take good notes or read good books or attend good conferences. James 1, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And the part that's always stood out to me about that verse is the end where James warns against us deceiving ourselves because all of scripture would, being that it is truth, have the potential to protect us from deception. Anytime truth goes forward, it equips people to avoid being deceived. Well, so if all of Scripture does that, why would there be a verse that points out a particularly strong area of deception? Except that that must be a particularly strong area for us to be deceived. And so he says this, be doers of the word and not hearers only, because it is a very strong temptation for us to believe that we have done enough just because we have heard, because we have attended that study, because we have went to Sunday school, because we read that book, or because we were part of that home fellowship. And so it's so important for us to go past hearing to doing. And I mention all this because that is what Jesus is saying to us in this verse. Notice the words, bear his own. This reminds us that discipleship involves much more than simply hearing it is also about doing disciples are more than just people who listen to lectures or sermons or read books disciples are people who learn by doing and one of the changes that took place in my understanding of what a disciple is which is what i hope to um, communicate to you this morning because my suspicion is many of you might have been under the same belief that I had been under prior to digging into these verses, that if I say disciple, one of the most common synonyms in people's minds seems to be student. And I actually want to discourage you from thinking of a disciple as a student, because students typically learn, and that's it. They're not known for doing. A better synonym for disciple would be apprentice. And so if I could invite you from now on, when you think about disciples, do not think just about students or learners, but think about doers or apprentices. You picture students, whether they're in elementary school or college, and what do you think of? You think of these, these students behind desks who are doing little more than learning. But if I invite you to think about apprentices, what do you think of? You think of people who are doing. It's very hands-on. They're applying the knowledge that they are receiving. Now, if disciples were simply students, then this is what Jesus would have said. Make sure you're listening to me and paying attention. Watch me take up my cross and learn from me doing that. But instead, Jesus is expecting us to be disciples or apprentices. Apprentices says, you need to pick up your cross too. You need to pick up your cross and deny yourself like I am. And this is important because of the temptation to simply be students or simply be learners and not be disciples, to go to church, to listen to the sermons, to read the books, to attend Sunday school or home fellowship. And all those are wonderful things. I'm always encouraged when I see people attending Bible studies and learning and growing in God's Word. But the fact is, if we're not applying what we're learning, then we're making an, an incredibly unfortunate mistake. We are believing that we have done enough simply by learning. And what the, oddly, believe it or not, if you were to learn and not apply, it would be better for you not to have learned at all because once you learn, what is higher for you? 
your accountability. Now God holds you responsible, more responsible because of what you have learned. So our knowledge has to be applied or it's not helping much. We must be those who go beyond just, and th- th- we're, we, are, we know Jesus picked up his cross. We know that he hung from it. We know what Jesus did, but we need to go beyond just being learners to being willing to suffer for Christ too or pick up our crosses too, which brings us to lesson two. Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple if you won't. Lesson two, suffer for me. He says, you can't be my disciple if you won't suffer for me. And this parallels the idea of hating our own life in verse 26. People who hate their own life, as Jesus said in verse 26, are going to be willing to pick up their cross to follow Christ. Now, we have so much familiarity with the cross that there's such an imagery in our minds when I mention the cross that it causes us to miss what it sounded like to Jesus' hearers 2,000 years ago when he said this. And I really want us to hear these words from Christ the way that his listeners heard them from him when he said it 2,000 years ago. And I was trying to figure out the best way to do this, and I think it would be by contrasting the typical imagery associated with the cross in our day with the imagery of the cross in Christ's day. Now, in our day, we love crosses. We put them up in churches, right? And I'm thankful for the cross that we have up behind us to remind us of what Christ has done. Many businesses that want to reveal that they're Christian, they will put them in their brand or in their logo. They'll change certain letters like the letter T into a cross to make it evident that they're Christian. Uh, We hang crosses from rearview mirrors in our cars. We have crosses in our homes. We will have framed pictures of uh, beautiful crosses and we'll have little poems or verses next to them. We will wear crosses as jewelry or as adornments. We'll put them on necklaces or keychains. We will wear clothing that has crosses embroidered in it. Uh, We just love crosses. Few things are as endearing to us as, as Christians. Few things are as endearing to us as crosses. But do you think anyone thought about crosses this way in Jesus' day? No, absolutely not. It would be an understatement to say that the cross's imagery has done a 180 or changed dramatically in the last 2,000 years. When Jesus said that his disciples must pick up their cross, it would have been completely horrifying to those people who were listening. It would have made people think of the most violent, excruciating, grotesque death that they could imagine. People did not put up pictures of crosses in their homes. If I was to make it comparable to today, and I'm not joking, it would be like putting up a picture of an electric chair in your house. People did not wear crosses as jewelry or adornments. It would be like wearing a guillotine around your neck. People did not have statues of crosses. It would be like having a statue of a noose or perhaps a stake at which people were burned. And so instead, people had the exact opposite view or feeling about crosses than we do in our day. While we love the cross, people despised the cross. And for Christ to tell people that they had to pick it up would have been a completely shocking statement. Believe it or not, you might be quick to say, if I said, what does the cross represent, and you say death, it didn't primarily represent death, because there were plenty of ways that Rome could have executed people, some of them obviously more merciful than others. Crucifixion was chosen because of how unmerciful it was. What crucifixion represented were two things, suffering and humiliation. Crucifixion had been passed down from the Persians, the Phoenicians, and the Carthaginians. And so by Jesus' day, because it had been going on for so many years, the Romans had perfected it as an instrument of torture. The Roman executioners were able to inflict as much uh, punishment as possible. Now, I'm generally of the persuasion that where Scripture is, is vague, we should be vague. 
I'm not someone that's going to say that everyone should go out and watch the Passion of the Christ so that they can understand what Jesus went through in greater detail than Scripture provides. Scripture says he was scourged. We can have an appreciation for what Jesus went through, but the fact that the Bible does not give us incredible detail about it tells me that it's probably not something that I should be that detailed about, but I will say this much. When the Romans performed crucifixions, they knew where to put the nails to cause the most pain. They knew how to crucify someone so that that death would drag on as long as possible. Crucifixion, which is where we get our word excruciating, was so excruciating that people began to long for death. It was an act of mercy when, pe- when Rome brought people's crucifixion to an end by ending their lives. Now, to make loyalty to Rome attractive, guess what Rome said? If you will be a Roman citizen, you will not have to be crucified. And there were people that became Roman citizens relieved that they were never going to have to worry about that form of execution. There are probably other times that they thought, you know what, I'd, okay, maybe I'll have to die this way or that way, but at least I will not have to be crucified. Crucifixion was intended to be an, a deterrent. When people were crucified, where did they line up the crosses? In the most public places, along the roads that were heading into the city of Rome. Before people could be brought outside the city to be crucified, what first had to happen with those people? They had to carry their cross. They were marched through the city streets where they could be mocked and ridiculed. And we're familiar with that because of what took place with Jesus as he carried his cross, but the same occurred with other people. And Rome did this very deliberately. It it wasn't so much that the person had to carry their cross because Rome thought that it was so excruciating. Rome wanted people to carry their crosses so that people would look on and say, I will submit to Rome. I will obey. I do not want to have to go through that myself. Rome was communicating, this is what is going to happen if you rebel. So it was made as public as possible, as well known when you're coming into Rome and and the roads were lined. I listened one time, John MacArthur said that they just simply ran out of trees and space. And that's the only reason that they did not crucify more people. Now my point is, when Jesus made this statement that people had to bear their cross, it would have been absolutely shocking. And I just do not think it is as shocking to us as it should be. Christ was telling us that if we are going to be his disciples, we must be willing to suffer for him. He is not saying that every single disciple is going to suffer as much as he did, or that and most Christians throughout human history, I don't know what percent it would be that were actually crucified or what percent were actually uh, martyred or burned at the stake. It would be a very small percentage. Jesus is clearly not saying that every single disciple of his is going to have to suffer incredibly, but he is saying you must be willing to if that's what's called of you. When people carried their cross, it showed their submission to Rome. And Jesus is using it similarly. He is saying that just as much as crucifixion showed people's submission to Rome, because that's what every single time there's someone walking bent over with that cross on their back and then they're hanging on that tree, it showed Rome's power and authority and these people's need to bow the knee or submit. Well, That is how Jesus is using it similarly. But he's saying, instead of submitting to Rome, you need to be submitted to me. You need to recognize my authority in your life. You need to be that broken before me like people were when they were that broken before Rome. If we want to be Jesus' disciple, we must freely give him authority over our lives. It is to forfeit our rights. It's to hold our lives uh, incredibly loosely and be willing to pray which can be, honestly, it's somewhat terrifying prayer. Use me in whatever ways, Lord, would bring you the most glory. Whatever you want to do with my life, whatever ways you want me to serve you, whatever ways I could be a a vessel or instrument of your praise or the furthering of your kingdom, I invite you to do so. That is a terrifying thing to pray because of our fear associated with what the Lord might do with us. But I would also say this, the same Lord who expects us to pray that is the same Lord who was willing to hang on a cross for you. 
Because you don't want to pray that prayer when you question someone's what? Love for you? Concern for you? But the moment that you consider that the individual you're putting your life in their hands is the same person who hung on that cross, that is the Lord that you're submitting to, you can make that prayer, commit that prayer with, with an ease that would otherwise be nearly impossible. I cannot imagine praying that uh, regarding someone whose who's, uh, love for you or concern for you was in question. It's like Jesus said, I'm going to die. You must be ready to die too. If you want to be like those people who abandoned me, you can. We looked in our first sermon on this passage at many of the groups who quickly abandoned Christ, not even when they were told they were going to suffer, but simply because they were confused by the things that he was saying. And he says, you can abandon me like them if you want, but if you want to be one of my disciples, there's a cross for me, and you must be willing to have a cross for you as well. Whatever happens to me, you must be willing for the same to happen to you. I'm going to suffer. You need to be willing to suffer as well, because a student is not above his teacher. And if the teacher is willing to go through this, then the student must be willing as well. Paul said it like this, Philippians 1.29, it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. A wonderful thing to consider that anytime we're suffering, not because of our sin, because that's discipline, then we're the ones who introduce that suffering into our lives, but we're suffering for Christ, that it is, as hard as this is to believe, a grace, a blessing to be able to suffer for Christ because of all that he has done for us. And can't that put our, can't that put our suffering in a completely different light when we consider that we are doing this for Jesus, that it's just one small way considering everything that has been done for us, that this would be done in response to his sacrifice? Several things that we want as Christians. Just think about them for a moment. What are some of the things we want as Christians? Well, we want our sins to be forgiven. We want eternal life. We want to be in heaven. We want to receive our glorified bodies. And these are all wonderful blessings, but what do we not want as Christians? We don't want to suffer. Nobody does. And let it be an encouragement to you that Jesus himself didn't want to suffer. How do you know that Jesus himself was not sadistic? He said, if there's any other way, let this cut pass for me. It's not to say he questioned whether he would do it or not. He's basically letting us know two things. First, he was letting us know that going to the cross was not something he looked forward to or enjoyed. And second, he's letting us know there is no other way. If there was any other way for you to be saved or for me to be saved, Christ would not have been crucified. Well, Jesus is telling us, that to have these blessings, we must be willing to suffer with him. And I want to show you a few verses that elaborate on this. Turn to Mark 10. Turn to Mark 10. One book to the left. So the context, we're going to start at verse 35, but the context is in verses 32 through 34, Jesus predicted, get this, for the third time that he is going to die. We are picking up right after Jesus for the third time predicted that he was going to die. Look at verse 35 with me. Oh, by the way, here's, let, let me give you a little more context. The disciples are closer to, they're near to Jerusalem uh, they're less than two weeks from Jesus' crucifixion. And I want you to just think about this for a moment. Two weeks from Jesus' crucifixion, approaching Jerusalem, and what do the disciples expect is going to happen when Jesus reaches Jerusalem? Because they do not believe his prediction that he will die. He's not, he's not going to Jerusalem to become suffering servant. He's going to receive his crown. He's going to Jerusalem to become king. The disciples are following Jesus. The anticipation and excitement is reaching heights that's never reached before because we are with days, within days of our Lord sitting on the throne of David. 
we are going to be firsthand observers of Jesus overthrowing Rome. We are going to witness, be the closest to Christ when witnessing Israel being restored to their golden years. Golden years that even exceeded the golden years known under Solomon's reign. That's what's going through the disciples' minds at this time. And that's why when Jesus says he's going to die, they can't fathom it. Now, here's the other thing. As Jesus' 12 right-hand men, when Jesus sits on this throne, where do you think that they think they're sitting? Next to him. And so here's the point. They don't expect Jesus to suffer, and they don't expect to suffer. With that in mind, look at verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, they came up to Jesus and they said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now, first, whoever says this to Jesus, right? <laughs> Who talks to Jesus like this? Well, actually, James and John didn't talk to Jesus like this. Who did? Their mother. We know from the other gospel that they sent their mom to do this. <laughs> The parallel account in Matthew's gospel tells us that. So they don't want to talk to Jesus like this, so they send their mother. And then it says Jesus said to them, but I'm assuming he said it to their mother, and then she related to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. So it's like we're heading to Jerusalem, you're going to be king soon, and receive glory and we want to receive that glory with you. We want to be those closest to you, sitting on your right hand and your left, so that when people see you, we are the very next people that they see. Now, this response from Jesus is interesting. He doesn't tell them no like we would expect. Look at verse 38. Jesus said to them, "'You do not know what you are asking.'" Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? So Jesus, when he says, are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? We just talked about that a moment ago. That's the cup of God's wrath. And the word baptized means, or baptize means immerse. And so Jesus is saying, are you willing to swallow the wrath that I will be swallowing? And are you willing to be baptized or immersed in the suffering that I am going to be immersed in. Verse 39, they said to him, shockingly, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink, and the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. I don't know what exactly the disciples understood right at this moment, but considering that they're thinking that within two weeks they're going to be receiving glory with Christ, and now Jesus tells them you're going to be suffering, which did they? Did the disciples suffer? With the exception of Judas, and, and let's say John, I'll explain John in just a moment, all of the disciples, Judas hung himself so he couldn't be martyred, ten of the other, the other ten disciples were martyred, and then John, the apostle John, who's at the foot of the cross, that wrote the gospel of John, first, second, and third John, and the book of Revelation, was boiled in oil, church tradition tells us that, and then when he survived, he was exiled on the island of Patmos. And so it's not to say that just because John wasn't martyred that he didn't suffer terribly. And so when Jesus says, you're going to be baptized, you're going to swallow the suffering that I swallow, they most certainly did. Verse 40, and then he says, but to sit at my right hand or at my left, it is not mine to grant, but it is for those of whom it has been prepared. And when the 10 heard it, they began, to, the other 10 disciples began to be indignant toward James and John. Now, why were the other 10 disciples angry at James and John? Were they angry that they would be so selfish and prideful as to ask such a thing? <laughs> no. They were angry because they wanted to be the ones sitting on Jesus's right and left, and they were angry that James and John tried to take that position for themselves that the other 10 also wanted. And I wanted to look at these verses for two reasons. First, they reveal what Jesus is communicating in Luke 14, verse 27, that if we want the glory, we also have to be willing to accept the suffering. And 
I think that the mistake that the 12 disciples made here is the same mistake that we can make. We can want the glory without the suffering. We want all of the other incredibly wonderful benefits that come with being a Christian, and I, I would not minimize them whatsoever. They are incredible. The forgiveness of sins, the glorified bodies, the eternity in heaven. But Jesus is just saying, yes, you want that, but you must be willing to suffer as well. And if we understand this, that by telling us to pick up our cross and follow him, he's saying that suffering is part of the plan. And if we understand this, it allows us to have the right perspective. It allows us to view suffering differently than we would otherwise. In fact, there's a sense in which if we view suffering this way, it allows us to view suffering the way that our Savior viewed suffering. I think Pastor Nathan uh, shared it during communion when he prayed. Hebrews 12, 2, Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. In other words, Jesus himself was willing to suffer for the glory that followed. And so to be willing to suffer for the glory that follows is simply to be like Christ. And Jesus is inviting us as our teacher saying that as one of my students, follow my example. Now, I want to introduce you to a lesson that is going to tie up not just this sermon, but is going to tie up the last few sermons that have dealt with this, to me, very challenging and wonderful portion of Scripture. And this brings us to lesson three. Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple if you won't, lesson three, get off the fence. You cannot be my disciple if you won't, lesson three, get off the fence. And then you can turn to Joshua 24. I want to get a little momentum into this lesson by looking at a few examples that will build up or establish a theme that I think builds up to the verse we saw or the verses we see in Luke 14. I'll explain the connection in a moment. So for now, all you need to do is just notice this theme that's created in Scripture, and then I will connect the dots for us at the end. So Joshua 24, do your Bibles have a title for this chapter? Is there a title? Huh? What? Joshua 24. We will serve the Lord? Okay. Or renewing the covenant, something along those lines. Joshua's approaching the end of his life, and he has this final message to his people here that he has loved and led for these 25 years through the conquest of Canaan. Now, we're not going to read all the verses, but I'm going to give you a brief outline. In verses 1 through 13, Joshua recounts to the nation of Israel all of God's goodness to them up to this point. So Joshua reminds them about them becoming a numerous nation, which they never should have been because their father and their father's wife, Abraham and Sarah, were both barren. He reminds them about deliverance from Egypt, uh, parting the Red Sea to swallow up the Egyptian army that was pursuing them. He reminds them about caring for them and all of God's provision in the wilderness. And then he reminds them about bringing them into the promised land and then defeating all of the enemies that they faced. Let's pick up in verse 11. Joshua 24, 11. You went over the Jordan. You came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you, and also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Canaanites Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. I gave them into your hand. Verse 12. I sent the hornet before you. Apparently, the Israelites weren't strong enough themselves. God sends out these hornets, which drive them out before them. The two kings of the Amorites, it was not by your sword or by your bow. I gave you victory over all these enemies. Verse 13, I gave you a land which you had not labored and cities you had not built to dwell in them. You eat the fruit of vineyards and olive orchards that you did not plant. That is incredible. God gave them land that they didn't work for, cities that they didn't have to build, and vineyards and orchards that they didn't have to plant. Now, that would be a blessing to anyone throughout all of human history, but it was an especially wonderful blessing for the Israelites in the Old Testament when life was particularly difficult and everyone had to work for every single little thing that they got. God gave all of this to the Israelites. So what would you expect Joshua to say to the people? Look at how, this is what he's saying, look at how good God has been to you. You better serve him. Consider all that he has done for you. Consider all his faithfulness. Why wouldn't you want to be faithful? He does say this, but I want you to notice something else he says. Look in verse 14. 
Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Verse 15, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, and notice this, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, give me your attention so I can ask you something. Would you ever imagine that Joshua would instruct people, God's people, to serve the gods of the Canaanites. But you can read it a thousand times, and it still says the same thing. That Joshua told them to serve the gods of the Canaanites. The gods who introduced so much wickedness into the people that worshiped them that they had to be wiped out as a people group. Now, why would Joshua do that? Is it because he truly wanted the Israelites to worship the false gods of Canaan? No, not at all. But he did want the Israelites to serve the gods of the Canaanites versus sitting on the fence. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, serve God or serve the gods of the Canaanites, but don't sit on the fence. Don't be neutral toward the Lord. Be for him or be against him, but don't be neutral. Serve the God of Israel or serve the gods of the Canaanites, but no matter what you do, the one thing you cannot do, the one thing that would be even worse than serving the gods of the Canaanites is being neutral toward God. And so think of it like this. As as horrible as it would be for people to serve these false gods. And it was. I mean, they were wiped out for doing it. Joshua says, it would be even worse for you to be a fence sitter. It would be even worse for you to be neutral. Turn to 1 Kings 18. So after Samuel's 1 Kings chapter 18... Elijah's famous showdown on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. Elijah knows already that he's going to have victory over them because of his faith in God, and God has called him to do this. But look what he says to the Israelites first. 1 Kings 18, verse 20. Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah, verse 21, Elijah came near to all the people and he said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? Which is basically Elijah's way of saying what? How long are you going to sit on the fence? If the Lord is God, follow him. But notice this. If Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. unbelievably tragically they couldn't decide it seems look back at the verse it says if Baal then follow him you've got the prophet Elijah who was raised up primarily or or for this reason more than any other to remove the worship of Baal from the nation of Israel because of its introduction through Ahab and Jezebel, or Ahab's father Omri, but then then in a much more significant or larger way through Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah comes on the scene to destroy this idolatry, but he tells the Israelites, worship Baal. If you're not going to worship God, worship Baal. And why would he say this? Because serving Baal isn't terrible? Of course, it's, in, it's incredibly wicked. But he says, even that would be better than you sitting on the fence with God. Turn to Revelation 3. Verse 
the seven churches in Revelation, even if you, and they have names of the places where the churches were located, but the churches also have names that serve as descriptions of them. Now, my suspicion is, even if you can't remember the description of the other churches, you probably know the description of the Laodicean church. You might know the, the description of the church of Ephesus, that that's the church that lost what? Their first love. But I bet even if you don't know anything else about any of the other churches, you know that Laodicea is what church? It is the lukewarm church. Or another way to say it is, they are the church of the fence-sitters. And look what Jesus says to them in verse 14. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now I've heard commentators, Bible teachers I respect, present two different interpretations of these verses. To be candid with you, I'm not completely sure which one is correct. One interpretation is basically cold water and hot water is good. And we know that because we like drinks that are really cold or really hot, but I've never heard anyone say, deliver me my drink lukewarm, right? No, nobody finds that to be a very pl pleasant way to drink. The other interpretation is Jesus is, so instead of both hot and cold being good, Jesus is saying, be on fire for me, or have nothing to do with me, but don't be lukewarm, as though fire hot is good and cold is bad. I'll tell you this. The one thing everyone does agree on is being lukewarm is bad. Nobody disputes that, because this is what Jesus says will cause him to spit people or vomit people out of his mouth. I don't know. I mean, it's one of the most graphic descriptions in all of the Bible that to be lukewarm or to be a fence-sitter is to be someone that the Lord himself would want to vomit out of his mouth. So he says, be hot, be cold, whatever you think hot or cold represent, but don't sit on the fence. Don't be lukewarm. Now, to tie this back to Luke 14, the verses in 25 to 27 that we started a few weeks ago, I am convinced that these verses that we have been studying for these weeks are intended to prevent fence sitters. Jesus saw huge crowds coming after him, and he wanted to make sure that they were not sitting on the fence. And so what does he say to them? He says, you cannot be my disciple if you will not, what? Hate your father, hate your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, even your own life, and pick up your cross and follow me. Because if anything is going to get people off the fence to one side or the other, it is these verses that Jesus preached in Luke 14, 25 to 27. What? There are so many things that sound attractive that allow people to sit on the fence. Who wouldn't want to be told that their sins could be forgiven? Who wouldn't want to be told that they can receive a glorified body and all the disease and sickness and aches and pains will be done away with? Who wouldn't want to be told that they don't want to have to go to hell? Those are the things that can allow someone to sit on the fence while they entertain or consider the wonder of those blessings. But the moment that Jesus says these verses, he causes people to serve him or abandon him. He tells people, be a sheep or be a goat. Be a wheat or be a tear. Be hot or be cold. Just don't be lukewarm. He's asking us to make a choice. He's saying, follow me or forsake me, but don't be neutral toward me. He has not left us that option. Now, I want to close with this quote from Charles, and I would just invite you, just where are you at with Christ? Do you sit here today on the fence, just in the privacy of your own heart, 
have I been preaching on this, or you have listened for these weeks about Jesus saying these words, and if you're honest, you're a fence-sitter. You've heard about Christ. You can probably recite the gospel as well as anyone who's been a Christian for some length of time, but you're just, you're on the fence. You're not going to take the step forward, but you're not willing to take the step back. Jesus would say, do one or the other, but get off the fence. Make a decision here. Follow me or forsake me. Let it be exposed that you were a terror. Let it be exposed that you were a goat, but at least don't leave people thinking you're wheat or a sheep when you're not. So make a decision. Charles Spurgeon said, keep your eyes simply on Christ. Let his death, his sufferings, his merits, his glories, his intercession be fresh upon your mind. When you wake in the morning, look to Christ. When you lie down at night, look to him. Do not let your hopes or fears come between you and Jesus. Follow hard after him, and he will never fail you. When you keep in mind the truths that are contained in God's word, I don't know how anyone would forsake Christ. I don't know how anyone, when thinking about what he was willing to do for us, would turn from him. But Jesus says that it would be better to do that than to stay neutral toward him. I have a brief statement to make after the closing song, and then if you have any questions about anything that I shared this morning, I will be up front after service. I would consider it a privilege to be able to speak with you, answer any questions, or pray with you. Father, we thank you for these challenging words from Christ. I believe he preached to these large, inflated crowds, wanting them to make a decision and not continue following him unless they were committed to suffering and everything that's involved with being a disciple. And so I would pray, if there's anyone here who's on the fence who would be part of those bloated, cloud, bloated crowds in his day, that they would make a decision, that they would be convicted. Lord, help all of us to know where we're at with Christ, that we wouldn't be deceived, and that if we have been neutral for some time, that we would make a decision one way or the other, that, that we would be pressed with that, because I believe that that's what Jesus pressed forward to the crowds that were following him. I pray, Lord, keep in mind those things that Christ has done for us with any people who would be neutral. Lord, remind, remind them of his sacrifice, Lord. We pray you'd open their hearts to the gospel and save them. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.